Good afternoon. My name is Don Tani Ploffel, and I'm the Associate Director of Academic Ventures and Engagement here at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. It is my distinct honor to welcome you to today's exciting discussion in the Institute's Climate Change Science Lecture Series. Earlier this academic year, in October of 2022, we launched our multi-year focus area on climate change and climate justice with our science symposium titled, A Pale Blue Dot Under Pressure, Climate Change, Justice, and Resilience in Our Rapidly Warming World. I note that a full recording of the symposium is available on the Radcliffe Institute website. This climate change initiative is our institute-wide and multidisciplinary effort to investigate the causes and consequences of the climate crisis, to develop strategies in adaptation and mitigation, and to address issues of climate justice in thought and action analytically, normatively, and politically. In particular, we seek to address the effects of the climate crisis on marginalized and vulnerable communities, both locally and globally. At the heart of this work is Radcliffe's commitment to supporting and sharing research that promotes innovative solutions and greater equity. This reflects Radcliffe's bedrock commitment to interdisciplinary study, informed by an equally deep dedication to inclusion. We firmly believe that these approaches will generate valuable new insights into effective and equitable ways of addressing climate change. Today's science lecture titled, More or Less in Common, Environment and Justice in the Human Landscape, to be delivered by our featured speaker, Dr. Garrett Dash Nelson, brings into focus the Institute's emphasis on addressing climate change from a multidisciplinary perspective, particularly informed today by combining scientific analysis and historical understanding. How can historical visualizations illuminate past inequities, present realities, and future possibilities for adapting to and mitigating the effects of climate change? Our speaker will explore the uneven distributions of harm, responsibility, and power in perspectives both historical and local. The city of Boston and its surrounds will serve as a microcosm for the exploration of ways in which climate change will amplify a century's worth of environmental injustice. Can historical visualizations help us to overcome the structuring effects of this legacy? Garrett Dash Nelson is the president, head curator, and director of geographic scholarship at the Norman B. Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. Our speaker, Dr. Nelson, will be joined in discussion by our moderator, Professor Ido Berger, faculty co-director of the science program at Harvard Radcliffe Institute and professor of astronomy in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. On behalf of Professor Berger, I encourage those watching to use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time during the program. But please keep your questions concise so that we can explore as many questions and topics as possible. It is now my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Dr. Garrett Dash Nelson. Thanks, Don. What a wonderful introduction. And before I get started, I want to thank both Don, uh, Professor Berger, and the whole Radcliffe uh, Institute events team led by Jessica Veekland for having me here today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be uh, speaking with a group that sort of thinks very broadly about what fits under the heading of climate change science. Uh, and I'm really pleased to be bringing this perspective into conversation with some of the other lectures and topics that this series has addressed. Uh, it's also really a pleasure in this virtual environment to see how different types of institution of learning are conversing with one another, to bring an institution like the Harvard Radcliffe Institute together with a public library, and then beyond that to folks from the broader public, citizen scientists, activist groups, and learners from all walks of life. In today's presentation, I'm going to be speaking on the topic of more or less in common environment and justice in the human landscape. And that title is drawn from an exhibition of the same name that I curated here at the Leventhal Center in 2022. For those of you in Boston, if you've never visited the Leventhal Center, we are a research, education, collections, and exhibition center that's free to the public at the Boston Public Library's Central Library in Copley Square. More or less in common was on display in our exhibition gallery from March to December of 2022. You can see a photo of the exhibition on display on the left side of the screen here. Uh, 
And although it closed uh, in person at the end of December of last year, it remains online as a digital exhibition, the link below. Nearly all of the images that I'm gonna to show today are also available in the more or less in common digital exhibition. I encourage you to spend time there, both to zoom in and explore the images, maps, and other collections objects in greater detail, and also to get further down into some of the topics about which I'll uh, offer a broad introduction in today's talk. I'm gonna start with a pair of images that are actually not maps at all. Um, but are instead posters about the environmental movement from less than half a century ago. On the left is a poster from the United States Environmental Protection Agency printed in 1975 in the heyday of the early environmental movement. And the text on the top says, the good things in life belong to all of us, let's protect them. The image has no people in it, it has a, a sort of very 70s era illustration of a, tree and then in the sky and a bird in the distance. And on the right is a poster from around the same time, about a decade later, uh, published by an activist group called the War Resisters League. This poster takes a very different interpretation of what constitutes the human environment, which is a pyramid with the consumers of the rich world at the top, supported in a hierarchical order by uh, the, the um, sort of immiserated peasants of the third world at the very bottom. And the text on this poster says, we must have order, but must it be the present order? Together, these posters form one of the key questions that's encoded into the title, more or less in common. And that is, is the environment something that really is in common for all of us, for all of the globe's residents? Or is it something that divides us apart? and makes the rich world different from the poor world, that indexes inequalities that run along racial, ethnic, national, and class lines. And paradoxically, we find in More or Less in Common and in the stories that I'm gonna to share today, that the environment, both over centuries and millennia of human history, as well as in the present, as we address issues like climate change and their associated environmental challenges, the environment is both something which binds everybody together, a common problem, a question that is all of ours to face together, but it's also something that pushes us apart. It's something that uh, it takes the social lines of divisions which are written through human society, amplifies them, worsens them, and in some cases creates them in the first place. This is a map uh, from a, essentially a century before the two posters that I just showed you. The map of Boston, uh, north is at the top right of this map, so it's a little bit out of orientation to what you might be familiar with in a map of Boston. And what we're seeing here is one of the earliest attempts to kind of understand an environmental challenge in the urban landscape of Boston. In the 1870s, the word environment and certainly the modern apparatuses of environmental management did not exist the way we think of them today. So this map doesn't call itself a map of environmental problems. It calls itself a map of the offensive odors that were perceived in Boston at this time, published by the city's Board of Health. This is quite literally a smelly map. The red areas, hash marks and arrows on this map show parts of the city which were foul smelling at the time. Uh, this is a moment when Boston is rapidly industrializing, growing into its surrounding areas, its population is exploding, new forms of technology like rail lines and new industrial developments are happening everywhere. And as a consequence, the city realized that there were some pretty disgusting parts of its kind of environmental conditions, especially on the edge of the growing city. I'm going to focus on two parts of Boston that at this point in 1878, from the perspective of foul odors were pretty similar to one another. Here we're zoomed in on uh, just west of the Boston Public Library. So the library is in the lower right of this map. This is the area that becomes the Back Bay Bends. As you can see, it's a muddy river delta, literally the delta of the muddy river. Uh, and it was filled largely with sewage at this time. And unsurprisingly, it smelled pretty bad. The big red arrow shows the, the way that the winds would carry foul smells over uh, the residential neighborhoods of the Back Bay. And so unsurprisingly, Bostonians of all stripes, and particularly elite Bostonians who controlled public agencies like the Board of Health, were concerned about this. Here's another bay in Boston, uh, less than two miles away. This is South Bay, 
It was also a shallow tidal estuary beginning to be filled by modern development. It also smelled bad at this time. From a purely biophysical scientific perspective, South Bay and Back Bay are not very different. South Bay is a bit more tidal than Back Bay. Um, but beyond that, uh, from this perspective of 1878, they're pretty similar landscapes. Their ecology, their environment, their geology are not so far apart from one another. And they're literally less than two miles apart. Here's what Back Bay and South Bay look like today. On the left is the Back Bay Fens. Uh, one of Boston's uh, most world famous open spaces, recreational spaces, one of the gems of the Emerald Necklace system. And on the right is South Bay. Uh, it's primarily a parking lot and big box stores transected by railroad lines, uh, classification yards, and Interstate 93. This map or these images by themselves don't tell you very much about social divisions, but as I'm sure all of you who are familiar with Boston already know, and for those of you who aren't Boston, you might be able to intuit simply from the, these two images, the socioeconomic demographics of these two neighborhoods are quite different as well. The areas around Back Bay are some of the most elite parts of Boston, it features some of the most elite institutions in the city, uh, including the Boston Public Library, not so far away uh, to the right of the, this image excerpt. Whereas South Bay is surrounded by a highly working class, highly diverse uh, neighborhood. In fact, Boston's major uh, uh, locus um, um, for the homeless population is just to the left of this image. And so these places are very different today. Their physical built landscape is very different. Their socioeconomic landscape is different. The key question in the exhibition, more or less in common, is how do places get to be so different? And how do their environmental differences index onto their social differences? The ways that economic, class, racial, and other lines make some places affluent and generally the sites of positive environmental entities, whereas other places are literally marginalized, pushed to the edges of protected spaces, and oftentimes made to face the most dire consequences of environmental harm. Now, this is both statistically robust. Uh, this is uh, from a 2021 study, uh, primarily led by scientists at the Nature Conservancy, which looks at tree canopy coverage and how it's uh, geographically correlated uh, with income in United States cities. Again, look at these two images. One has a lot more trees. It also has a lot more rich people and a lot more white people than the other image. And this bears out in statistically on the left, this line chart, uh, we have the lowest income quartiles on the left of the chart, the highest income quartiles on the right. The black line shows uh, forest cover. This is urban tree canopy increasing as we get into, into richer neighborhoods. The blue line is the white population, which also increases uh, together with forest cover and income and population density decreases. The, this inequality is most pronounced in northeastern cities. You can see the pink dots on this map are the cities with the uh, greatest difference in forest cover between rich and poor neighborhoods, and Boston is among the most exaggerated of those. Now, that's a statistical and geographic correlation that holds up in the present day, but in order to explain it, we need to go back, in some cases, many centuries. These are two maps of these same two neighborhoods that were shown in the exhibition. On the right is a plan of South Bay from the mid 19th century, uh, published by uh, the uh, public agency that was in charge of regulating the harbor front industry. And as you can see here, uh, the, the sort of engineering and uh, land use controls for South Bay were all put towards industrial uses. Uh, it became a magnet for dirty, polluting industries by the end of the 19th century. And at the beginning of the 20th century, when Boston writes its first zoning code, South Bay becomes one of the places where there are literally no land use controls, one of the few places where you can do anything, um, as opposed to the much tighter regulations, which began to be put into force in the rest of the city. On the left is a map of Back Bay, published as the city was beginning to consider turning this space into a park. So this map is actually contemporaneous to the first one that I showed you, that's 1877, that Odors map was 1878, so these are at the very same time. 
And this was the solution for Back Bay, was to clean it up, to turn it into an environmental amenity, to totally reshape its natural environment in order to make it a both marketable and beautiful space for Boston's elite residents. Uh, if you were to zoom in closely on this map, you'd see that not only does it demarcate the space to become a future park, but also the lot lines for a speculative residential development all around the margins of the park. Now, this show was held in 2022 in part because it was the bicentennial uh, of the birth of uh, the landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted. Excuse me, the, the um, uh, yeah, the, the, of, the, of, of Olmsted's birth. And we use that as an excuse to think about the way that landscape architects and urban designers have shaped these spaces of urban difference, of urban environmental change over many, many decades. In this map, which was actually produced by the Olmsted firm after they had arrived to Boston to manage places like the emerging Back Bay Park system, uh, shows a, a stretch of the famous emerald necklace in Boston that was never completed. At the left of this map is Franklin Park, the gem of Olmsted's park system in, in Boston. And at the right, very extreme right of this map is what's now Castle Island. And the two were meant to be collect, connected by an elegant park boulevard uh, running down Columbia Road. You can just see South Bay poking out of the center top of this map. So think about, again, uh, where, where that uh, location was ac across the Boston's historic peninsula from Back Bay. The Columbia Road Parkway that was designed by the Olmsted firm was never built. And today it's a diverse, primarily working class, part of Boston, its socioeconomic characteristics are very, very different from the neighborhoods that ring the part of the park system that did get built. Environmental justice has always, since that term uh, sort of emerged in the last third of the 20th century, been about local fights for equity and resilience in communities that have historically been excluded from those kinds of assets and amenities. Here we're moving to the other side of Boston. We're looking at East Boston. At the top of this map is Chelsea Creek, uh, both in the 19th uh, century as well as today, one of the most polluted parts of Boston's harborfront environment. And I'll just say as a brief little sidebar to this map that Atlas plate that you're looking at here is also part of one of our most widely used web map discovery tools, Atlascope, which you can visit at atlascope.org. And Atlascope happens to be the basis for the exhibition that we currently have up in our gallery called Building Blocks, Boston Stories from Urban Atlases. In this particular Atlas plate, which comes from 1922, you can see the uh, extensive oil facilities that uh, were installed by this time. You can actually see that they were owned at the time by Standard Oil Company. The name of property owners is, is shown on these kinds of atlases. And um, the, the oil facilities are still, uh, some of them are still there today. Logan Airport is just below and to the right of this map. And this area around Chelsea Creek and the Mystic River has become one of the most prominent sites for local, uh, local contests, local activism against these kinds of dirty, polluting, in, uh, 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 degraded landscapes. We talk in the exhibition about a, a really powerful activist group called um, Green Roots um, that's been doing amazing work in exactly this area, particularly around the Chelsea Creek in this independent city of Chelsea, as well as in East Boston, uh, protesting the way that their communities have historically been the places where things like the oil facilities, which you see here in 1922, uh, power transmission plants and, and, uh, and other sort of industrial land uses have been cited. But this map is also an opportunity to think about the conflicting and connected scales of environmental justice challenges. And it's those scales that will become particularly resonant when we think about the challenge of climate change. The oil tanks here are not being cited in East Boston primarily because the residents of East Boston were demanding a lot of oil. They're being cited here because it's a transshipment facility for demand for fuel oil throughout all of New England, for uh, jet oil, uh, petrochemical products going into the, the um, 
the airport that's just next door. And this mismatch between uh, the, the geographies of who is demanding the kinds of things that cause environmental degradation. For instance, the geography of demand for oil in New England, which is, involves both uh, consumers throughout the region, as well as international travelers passing through the airport, is then spatially concentrated on a much smaller and almost always politically, socially, economically weaker group of people the sorts of people who don't enjoy the ability to say no to these sorts of facilities when they're proposed or when they're built. And these sorts of uh, historically accumulating injustices stay with us in the present. But of course, those geographies are connected spatially, uh, both to the region and to the broader world. Sometimes the interconnections of geographies are quite obvious. This is a map that our team made for the exhibition showing noise pollution, primarily surrounding airports. So you can see noise pollution doesn't respect political boundaries very well. And for anybody who's in uh, New York or Washington DC today, you're witnessing another environmental crisis that doesn't respect boundaries and connects spatialities. Uh, as the wildfires burn in Northern Canada and bring environmental harm to people across national and regional borders. But even going back to 1922, when this particular map was made and when these oil facilities uh, were sited along the Chelsea Creek, uh, was already part of a global network of environmental change. It's a map from the, around the same period, from the 19-teens. It was actually in the holdings of the Boston Public Library at the time. And this map, uh, the, the sort of mishmash of colors on this map show foreign oil companies' claims around what's now Venezuela and Colombia in one of the world's first oil rushes. Uh, this, we think this map probably was being used by uh, people coming to the library in order to steer investment decisions and to decide where to, you know, companies to put money into as they were scrambling for land around the Gulf of Maracaibo. And this is the oil that would have ended up in places like uh, the, the standard oil facilities along the Chelsea Creek and along the Mystic River. Now, the people who were experiencing the environmental harms of oil facilities being sited next to their homes were not necessarily the same people as the communities who lived around the Gulf of Maracaibo and whose uh, marine, uh, uh, marine livelihoods were almost totally wiped out by this oil rush. And today, this is one of the most um, severely polluted uh, kind of petrochemical landscapes in the entire world. So environmental justice has to contend with all of these scales, both of local activists fighting against the siting of facilities like oil transshipment facilities, but also the way that a global uh, economic and global climate uh, system connect places that are distant and highly unalike. This quote from the literary uh, critic Rob Nixon uh, uh, really captures some of the key questions around commonality and, and inequality that are central to our exhibition. Nixon writes, we may all be in the Anthropocene, but we're not all in it in the same way. Now the Anthropocene of course is the term coined by uh, but biophysical scientists and increasingly adopted by social scientists describe the era of human driven uh, environmental change at a global scale. And there's a key paradox there. It's both a, uh, a challenge, a crisis, a phenomenon that knits people together regardless of who or where they are, but it's also a challenge and a crisis which has worsened the differences and inequalities between people. So the Anthropocene has put us all together but not put us all together in the same way. That becomes a particular challenge when we think about climate change and the intricate spatial, uh, economic, uh, biophysical, atmospheric geographies of climate change. This is a map that was uh, one of the entry points into the exhibition. It's another map that we created originally for the show. It's titled A Shared Problem and an Unequal Burden. And it looks at the global geography of climate change from two perspectives. On the one hand, we've shown the footprint of the global population in purple here. Uh, this is used using a, a population, a gridded population data set of the entire world. And then in these white outline circles, 
we've shown the, the world's carbon footprint. And what that starts to reveal are the ways that the responsibilities and the consequences of climate change are highly spatially mismatched with one another. For instance, when we look at a place like Western Europe here, we see a lot of yellow rings relative to the size of the population. So Europe is sort of medium high uh, population in world terms, but it's extremely high in terms of its uh, global car carbon emissions. And especially so if we track those emissions from the beginning of the industrial period to the present. By contrast, uh, places in the global south, like Angola, which is what we're zoomed in on. In this excerpt, you can see there are hardly any yellow circles, and they are particularly uh, uh, trivial when compared to the number of people who live in these regions. So in the aggregate, although it's a little hard to see on a screen, this was a, a very large floor map in the actual exhibition, you can begin to tease out the way that uh, the, the um, uh, the people, the, the, the spatialities, the geographies, the, um, the nations that have driven the, uh, the, the causes of global climate change are not at all matched onto the geographies of who might experience these challenges. The outlined countries on this map are one social scientist's attempt to measure risk. It's a measurement uh, in this case that combines both biophysical or geophysical indicators like uh, elevation, as well as uh, questions about economic resource, political resources that might make mitigation and adaptation possible. And this question of risk is one that we come back to in one of the last maps of the exhibition, which is focused here on Boston. Again, thinking about the, the sort of intricately fractal spatialities of difference and togetherness uh, in um, uh, global climate change and global climate resilience, it's very hard to pick out the inequalities within Boston and a map of this scale, right? In, the, in this case, Boston is just one part of the rich world. Whereas if we zoom down into the city of Boston itself, we begin to see that there are deep differences in inequalities, even at that scale of observation. In this map, we've taken the city of Boston's official measurement of what they call social vulnerability. And we've uh, sort of re-examined it or, or, or made it narrative in a slightly different way than the city uh, uh, shows on, in its uh, kind of data exploration portal. What we've done is we've kind of counted up their seven different measurements of social vulnerability that range from income to uh, English language uh, status. And on this map, the neighborhoods that are uh, outlined in, in deep red with the number seven are the neighborhoods that match all seven of these vulnerability measures. Uh, neighborhoods with a zero or a one or a two are relatively less vulnerable. And then we show public open space, as well as coastal flood risk and the urban heat island effect. So first of all, we can pick out some of these gaping social inequalities that oftentimes are historically accumulated along lines of investment and disinvestment. As for instance here, the border of Hyde Park, Mattapan and Roslindale, where we see two neighborhoods that rank seven and six. Again, those are amongst the most vulnerable according to this metric. As we go over into Roslindale, we see zeros and ones. Uh, these are neighborhoods that are not at all socially vulnerable, uh, according to the city's uh, measurements. And what's interesting to, to note here is that there are some clear spatial correlations. For instance, in Chinatown, which is another focus of the exhibition, uh, Chinatown uh, scores six out of six, uh, six out of seven in its social vulnerability measures. Uh, it's also in a low-lying area that's flood prone and, and and it's also in a particularly um, uh, an area that's uh, liable to urban heat island effects. So this is a clear case where social vulnerability and uh, biophysical environmental vulnerability quite literally map on to one another. But elsewhere in Boston, the story is not quite so straightforward. This is the Seaport neighborhood. The city calls it the South Boston Waterfront officially in its neighborhood maps. Uh, the seaport is one of the least diverse, the, the most wealthy, and also the most climate risky neighborhoods in the entire city. It's built literally on fill. It's not very high above uh, uh, the waterfront, uh, or it's not very high above sea level. 
And it's almost certainly to uh, uh, just sort of topologically, topographically likely to be one of the places most likely to be impacted by rising sea levels. By contrast, this is Roxbury. As in, you see, there's a number of seven and five neighborhoods. These are uh, uh, neighborhoods that score high on the social vulnerability measures. Roxbury is actually on fairly high ground. It's located next to some good open spaces like Franklin Park. Um, and at the aggregate scale, it's not particularly vulnerable to urban heat island effects. And so when we look at a map like, like this in the aggregate, we have to think more carefully about what vulnerability, what social change, what environmental change might mean in the future. For instance, the kinds of resources that are available, the kinds of mitigation and adaptation strategies that are available to people who own multi-million dollar condos in the South Boston waterfront, even though those might be uh, located in a particularly biophysically risky zone, their strategies for change, for adaptation might look quite different from what somebody living in an overcrowded apartment in Roxbury might look like. And certainly the micro environments of what it looks like to be in a uh, apartment with no air conditioning um, might look very different, uh, even if you're, the neighborhood you're living in uh, uh, isn't subject, for instance, to the same urban heat island effects. The, the, in conclusion, the, the sort of three um, major questions that we try to emphasize throughout all of these stories and more or less in common are, first of all, that we have to go deep into the past to understand how urban, regional, and global environmental changes became indexed to social inequalities. The second is that we uh, need to think at complicated, uh, intricate intermeshings of scale, right? The, there are certain environmental inequalities which are uh, readily apparent if we think on the scale of neighborhoods or communities, and there are others that become apparent when we think at the scale of an entire globe. And then the final question to return to the original theme is to interrogate what it really means to have things in common with one another. Of course, we un well understand the, the lines of social division that make us feel at times that we don't have things in common with other people. The environment and the spaces in the environment are a provocation to think uh, both challengingly and creatively about that question of commonality, about the people that we share space with, about the people that we could share space with, and what a truly common approach to environmental mitigation in the future might look like. So with that, I'm going to turn uh, the session over to our conversation. And of course, and I'll, uh, we look forward to a, a conversation with those of you who are tuned in. And I'll bring uh, Professor Ido Berger back to the virtual floor to join me in a conversation and to pose some questions as well. Uh, and thanks, Garrett, for, for an enlightening presentation. Um, I would like to follow up. Um, with some prepared questions, um, as well as questions that have been coming in from our online audience. Um, and I'm, I'm going to interweave these questions uh, together and hopefully we'll have time to address all of them. And as a reminder for the audience, please uh, continue to submit your questions using the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And please keep them concise so we can get to as many of them as possible. Um, so Garrett, I would like to delve um, uh, some more into the historical perspective, but I'm actually going to uh, step aside for a second and, and talk first about uh, something that's been on everyone's mind on the U.S. East Coast uh, over the last few days, which is, um, you know, you, you've alluded to the, the hazardous air conditions that are driven by wildfires um, in Canada that are made worse by climate change. And I guess in a way, this is the modern version of the, the smelly conditions that you described um, earlier in your in your presentations. Uh, but this time, this is generated hundreds of miles away, um, and you know, average uh, uh, pollution levels in New York City yesterday, for example, uh, reached a peak of of 25 times higher than than what's recommended by the EPA. And schools have been shut down, and people have been uh, advised to to stay home or wear masks. Um, and it's it seems that this 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 air pollution is going to spread to other parts of the country um, uh, in coming days. So I have a couple of questions here. Um, first, with, with many discussions of climate change and its impacts, there's usually a focus on direct local effects, uh, which may be differential even within a single city, like, like water level rise, for example. 
Um, but here we're witnessing the impacts of climate change driven events are happening hundreds of miles away over which local municipalities or even the state or local government have very little control. Um, and yet we're seeing kind of similar patterns that these events are not affecting all regions equally. So I guess my question here to start with is how do you think about the intersection of exploring and uncovering local, you know, let's say neighborhood scale environmental injustices and patterns, and then these kinds of large scale kind of more global effects? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. One that I've certainly been thinking a lot uh, over the past week or so as we've witnessed this play out uh, on the eastern seaboard. You know, I think at its heart, there's a there's a kind of conceptual homology here, which is about the spatial mismatch between causes and effects, between responsibility and um, uh, sort of uh, uh, jurisdiction. Shall we shall we call it? Um, whether we're looking at you know individual neighborhoods of Boston, you know, thinking about who's who has to live next to the oil facilities for the airport versus who's using the oil facilities of the airport, right? That's a spatial mismatch, right? The the harm is concentrated in a way that the demand is not, right? So they quite literally don't match each other on a map. The the um, uh, the the dust from the or the smoke from the Canadian fires is another example of spatial mismatch, right? A, a citizen in New York City has literally no uh no standing right to to shape environmental policy in canada you're you're not a citizen of canada and so you have uh from a legal perspective uh at no stake or no standing in, in canadian environmental policy making whereas canadians might well say you know this is being driven by a changing uh global climate which is as much uh, the blame for that might rely as much on a uh, you know a consumer in New York City as it does on uh, you know somebody in um, within the political boundaries of Canada. So there there are all these spatial mismatches, right? And and the global climate is is such a, a, a um, dramatic example of that, right? Because uh, you know a, a a molecule of carbon dioxide doesn't know what <laughs> political jurisdiction it's in, right? Uh, you know the the um, uh, the 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 the, um, the effect of uh, of a of a changing global climate uh, doesn't respect human concepts of you know who's rich and poor who has power who doesn't have power um, so then it also you know it forces us to sort of think how how do how how would we think uh, in um, spatial terms that that can, that kind of match the problem. Frankly, I think that's very much an open question. We've certainly seen um, some of the limitations of, of global thinking or, or the um, uh, maybe the, the ways in which uh, the scale of our action or the scale of our policymaking does, doesn't in fact match the scale of the, of the problem. Um, but I think at its core, both, both of these, these questions involve these kinds of spatial mismatches. And, 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 and in that way, we can think of them as, as geographic or mapping problems. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, continuing with this, with this thread, you know, we, so we have these large scale patterns of air pollution that are moving across very large regions. Um, but do you think that there is still differential local effects? For example, if we take Boston, you know, we have air pollution coming over the city. Um, is it affecting everybody the same way, or are there still these differential effects that uh, persistent that that correlate with these persistent patterns of inequality that you've described? Yeah, it's a great question, and it, and it ties in a way to the to the map of Boston that I just showed you. You know, if we were to if we were to sort of say let's leave social questions aside, and let's purely look from a you know topographical standpoint of of which parts of Boston are most likely to be at risk from rising sea level. Um, you know, we might we might then say, oh, well, you know, it seems like the seaport is 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 really at risk, and you know, we should invest a lot of resources into protecting the seaport. That, of course, would ignore the fact that mo the majority of the residents of the seaport um, are quite privileged in terms of the amount of economic or political resources that are at their disposal to to deal with a potentially rising sea level. Um, whereas another part of the city, which maybe doesn't topographically look to be at risk in the same way from a, you know, setting aside uh, the, the social or demographic features of the era may in fact be at risk down the line of, you know, as 
for instance, as people are forced out of other sections of the city or as the city's finances are, are thrown into disarray by climate change. So that, that, that means that we quite literally have to include these kinds of variable in order to understand those differential risks with, um, uh, you know, with, with uh, the current uh, um, smoke uh, crisis, you know, how you experience it, that looks very different. Uh, you know, if you're the sort of person who has an outdoor service job, right? If you're a, a sanitation worker who works outdoors all the time, versus if you, uh, you know, have an office job in a in a building with state of the art HVAC facilities, right? So, you know, a map of where the smoke is doesn't actually tell us that much about within those geographies. How are people actually experiencing it? So coming back to the exhibition, so you know a, a clear trend of of more or less in common is that early decisions about how to use land and how to develop it, where to put highways, where to put parks, or industrial or residential zones, then then maps on to present day inequalities in environmental conditions and and climate change impacts. Um, and I have several questions related to this, but but the first thing I wanted to ask um, is what was it like to put together an exhibition of this sort where you're combining social science and environmental science and you're looking across such a broad range time span in, in the city's history and and how do you think um, the exhibit goers um, react to this visual history of environmental injustice in, in Boston? Yeah, it was certainly, uh, I would say I'd describe it as both a joy and a challenge. Um, it was a joy because this the, the, the question draws on so many themes in geography, right? Themes that naturally lend themselves to not only maps as objects, but the kinds of questions that geographers ask themselves and ask of the world. Questions about space, about differentiation, about the interaction between the social and natural worlds. Um, so those are all the key types of questions that we want patrons thinking about. It's really at the center of what we do here at the Leventhal Center. It was a challenge in the sense that there are so many different potential stories we could tell, right? So many examples of the way that these inequalities play out. And I, I'll add, oftentimes the structural story told by the map doesn't always capture the, the sort of individual story or the social story of the people that are inside of the map. Uh, so one of the things that we featured in the exhibition were the stories of communities and of people. So for instance, I showed you that, that photo of that, the, the activists with Green Roots protesting a, a proposed substation in East Boston. Um, we wove a number of stories like that into the exhibition or in order for people to think not just about the kind of grand geographic forces that are uh, shaping and structuring these kinds of challenges, but also how people are experiencing that on the ground, how they're resisting it, how they're organizing against it. Um, I do think in uh, uh, one of the one of the strengths of the show was the way that we brought historical and contemporary material together. Um, so, you know, we, we have maps in the show that go back uh, well over a century to think about the accumulated effect of these land use choices, these urban design questions and these social injustices to say, you know, they weren't, they didn't start with climate change, right? They didn't start with uh, the sorts of social and economic challenges of the late 20th century. They started much earlier than that and have accumulated over time. But then when we bring those kinds of uh, historical objects into dialogue with um, what maybe people are more familiar with as kind of scientific maps or scientific diagrams, we start to see uh, the relationship between those two ways of thinking. Yeah. And kind of, you know, kind of continuing on this on this theme of kind of how people might react to this information when it's put together in this particular way. I was wondering if in in preparing the exhibit, uh, was there something, a, a map or an artifact or a piece of writing that that you discovered that particularly surprised you or that you thought, you know, this would be particularly useful or impactful for current city policymakers to know about and to consider when they're making decisions today? Uh, yeah. about the environmental future of, of the city. Well, one thing I'll say is in, in that final map that I showed you, the map that, that shows social vulnerability in Boston, that's, we didn't invent that data set. Um, that data came from the city of Boston. It's used in policymaking. Um, you know, it's, it, it has actual statutory consequences for 
for what the city of Boston does. Um, but uh, uh, without wanting to um, uh, make too much of a critique, the way that the, the, the use, if you were to kind of go to the city and ask for that data, you'd get a kind of confusing, like classic web map layer that doesn't really tell much of a story, frankly. It's very difficult to interpret. And it's very difficult to even say like, what's going on here? We know there's, you know, we know there's flood risk, we know there's sea level rise, we know there's all these intersecting factors of, of vulnerability. So in that case, it was a, a, a deliberate choice we made um, as a center that really does think about the kind of narrative and rhetorical power of maps to take the same data set and display it using a different visual technique, one that was informed in some ways um, by historical cartography, that I think actually does a much better job of in, uh, kind of uh, thinking about the social and environmental um, shape of the current challenge facing Boston. So something like that, right, where, where it's not necessarily new data, it's not new information, um, but it's uh, it's narrated visually in a slightly different way, I think can be quite powerful. Yeah. And, and kind of staying on this theme of visualization, um, you know, earlier this this academic year, we had we had another Radcliffe lecture on visualization in the context of climate change that was titled um, Hurricanes and Breezes Visualizing Climate Change. And your presentation highlighted the power of visualizing the past using, using maps. And so um, do you see a, a, a place for essentially using not necessarily just a historical, but kind of real-time map data uh, that's, you know, where there's more and more availability of real-time information floating around, but putting it together, as you were saying, in a, in a way that will make it useful for decision makers um, and, and what do you think will, will it take to accomplish something like that? And is there a place, for example, for the public library to, to head such an effort? I'm, I kind of have two minds about this. On the one hand, I'm not naive about the way that, you know, uh, just better visualizations would somehow magically transform climate politics. And I, <clears throat> I think actually an instructive case is, uh, what happened in the course of the COVID pandemic, which of course is still going on in, in, in some ways you know, the widespread availability of maps related to the pandemic, um, you know, it's, it's a kind of key part of, of how we experience the pandemic. They're very reliable maps, right? They, they, you know, basically every media outlet had maps about uh, risk and vulnerability and institutions like John Hopkins had, you know, very sort of accurate, reputable maps. But there's a way in which there were, you know, that sort of ended up just kind of washing over people, right? I'll, I'll speak for myself and saying that, you know, at a certain point, those maps no longer helped me even understand where the risk was or what I should be doing about the pandemic. Um, I think some, th some of that is true uh, with climate change as well, right? It's one thing to get a kind of accurate depiction of the problem, and it's quite another to actually shape people's behavior, shape politics, shape what people think is important in a way that um, uh, that, that actually engages with, with, with that challenge. Um, and so I, I do think that, um, you know, narration is hugely powerful. I mean, the, 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 the physical experience of these orange skies, whether in Boston or New York or in, you know, previous years in, in California, of course, has, has, I think, dramatize the problem in another way there, there is a great example of a of a of a both visual and material demonstration of the problem but maps can you know maps and other diagrammatic uh, uh, visualizations can can do some of that but i don't think that there are you know some kind of magic course that if only oh, if only we had the the best maps and the most beautiful maps that you know suddenly uh, the the politics of climate would be would be solved um Question from the audience. Um, the, you know, you've talked about the kind of the, the structure of you know the city and different populations and socioeconomic um, um, conditions. But of course, this is a dynamic process, and people move around, um, and there's gentrification and and effects like that. So how how does that play into kind of shifting the the story or the the conditions in the city when when it comes to environmental? Um, yeah, one of the things I want I want to highlight is um, we we really wanted to make sure that in the map of social vulnerability, we didn't leave people thinking that you know these neighborhoods are just sitting ducks, right? That because they're statistically vulnerable according to a certain kind of socio demographic index that the city has put together, that they're just you know they're toast, right? 
um, we really wanted to highlight the the resources, the resilience that these community ha communities have and, 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 and will have in the future and the way that the, the future is kind of an unwritten story in that way. So uh, particularly thinking about uh, places like Roxbury and Dorchester in Boston, we highlighted um, uh, the work of a group called Climate Crew, Communities Responding to Extreme Weather that does uh, community-based work and upgrading HVAC facilities and, uh, you know, uh, bringing people into a, a grassroots community uh, movement. So, um, you know, taking the, the geographic context, the, the biophysical context as a, as the, the, the basis for action, but not as deterministic, right? It's not simply that people in risky areas, whether we measure that risk uh, demographically or socially or uh, biophysically, uh, it, it doesn't mean that it, it, it forecloses the future, right? And, and thinking about all the different ways that people might move, might change, but the way that they might adapt, I think those are really key questions uh, to thinking about the, the climate future. So we, we only have a few minutes left, but I want to kind of shift a little bit outside of Boston and, and take a broader view. So um, one thing that, that struck me earlier in your presentation, you highlighted that the Northeast and, and areas like Boston are particularly bad in terms of the differential impacts and correlation, for example, between you know, tree cover and white affluent population. Um, do you think this is just a reflection of kind of a longer historical trajectory compared to places like California, for example, and, and, or is there something else going on? And if so, how does that correlate with, you know, what's happening in other parts of the world, you know, old cities in Europe um, or other parts of the world where um, th this historical trajectory is even longer? I think probably a little bit of it can chalk up to just the, you know, the age of cities. Um, but I think uh, I'm speculating somewhat here, uh, but I think some of it in places like Boston actually does come from a story about landscape design that we tell in the exhibition. You know, we talk about the politics of, of of landscape and going back to somebody like Olmsted, who really did have this idea that, you know, we should design for everybody, you know, in a Certainly, in the 19th century context, he had this idea that the parks that that, that he and his firm were, were building in Boston were meant to to mix people from different backgrounds and to bring uh, a kind of common public together. But very quickly, even within Olmsted's own lifetime, many of those environmental or aesthetic indicators become very closely tied to ideas about class racial privilege, right? So here in Boston, you know, the leafy, we're one of the places that kind of invented the leafy exclusive suburb, right? So the, the same types of landscapes that are beginning to be built in public parks then quickly become uh, put into service for uh, deliberately exclusionary forms of residential development. And we talk in the exhibition about the history of uh, racial redlining and of the way that Boston's neighborhoods got um, kind of uh, pulled into kind of highly differential types of both physical environments as well as social environments. So I think that, that you know, it's uh, like, there's a there's a deliberate story there, right? Uh, when, you know, leafy suburbs, leafy affluent neighborhoods were actually created to to do that, to do that work, right? To to both prop up inequality uh, and to create a kind of environmental distinction between different types of places. So one um, kind of final question to end on a on a kind of future looking uh, note. Um, so as you kind of look around uh, Boston, around the country, different cities. Um, and, and thinking about kind of mitigation efforts and, and being cognizant of these differential impacts. Um, what kind of specific actions or, or educational efforts would you like to, to see or advocate for, um, um, you know, going forward that will, that will have a real effect in mitigating this differential environmental injustice? I think one of the greatest challenges is how do we act in ways that relate us to people who are in fact connected by the scale of the problem, right? You know, us sitting here in Boston, we're part of the same global climate as folks in China and folks in Angola, all around the world. And yet, you know, we're not in meaningful political systems with them, right? We don't, I, I don't vote in the same uh, electoral unit as, as, as somebody in Shanghai does. Uh, so, 
uh, th there's a there's a kind of imaginative part of that, right? Like how do, how do I treat the whole world seriously as my neighbors, right? How do I give the whole world moral status to me as 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 being connected to me, as being woven together with my own fate? And then how do we actually uh, kind of build political action around that, right? What would it mean to take seriously the fact that you know the consequences of our decision have to be felt by people who are spatially discontinuous from us? Uh, it's a that's a that's an enormously challenging question, and I would not pose to have the answer to it. But I think it's something that needs to be grappled with, and ultimately, it needs to be uh, achieved. Yeah. Um, there were there were quite a few questions that came in um, regarding uh, you know a lot of interest in the exhibit uh, itself, and so I just want to um, mention that uh, the exhibit is not uh, you know ended at the at the um, last year in December, right? Um, but all the uh, materials are available online at the at the Leventhal um, Center yep. uh, website. Do you do you have a plan to uh, re-exhibit these materials or to put them on on a permanent exhibit somewhere? Yeah, so uh, the digital exhibition is one way that we've kept this going in perpetuity. Um, I noticed somebody had asked about getting permission to use the images. Um, nearly every map in our digital collection is available for you to use however you like. There are a very small number of copyrighted maps um, for which that's not the case, but everything that I showed you today is available online and can be used in any kind of presentation or publication. Uh, environmental justice for us at the center is one of our perennial themes, right? It is the key question that links people's choices about um, politics and space together to the natural environment. And together, those are some of the great geographic topics. Um, we're, we weave those kinds of questions into many, many of the things that we do. So just by way of example, our, um, our K-12 education department works with um, with public school students all the time around how to engage with environmental questions, how to how to access data about their neighborhood and about uh, environmental change and about social uh, and demographic uh, change in 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 the places that they live. Um, so from our education programs to our permanent collections, this is a, a really key theme in the in the work that we do. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Garrett, for, for a wonderful presentation uh, and for answering uh, the questions uh, from myself and from the audience. Um, this concludes our, our program today. Um, and I would also like to thank our audience for, for the very insightful questions and for your interest. Uh, today's program has been recorded and it will be posted on the Radcliffe website in about a week. For information about upcoming Radcliffe programs and to see videos of past events, please visit our website, radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and take care.